Revelation chapter 21, another amazing chapter because we see in this particular chapter the final consummation of the divine purpose on the earth. In the first eight verses we find out from this chapter through the Apostle John the conditions that will prevail on this earth beyond the millennium and it's one of the rare occasions that, that we get details about that time. Later on in the chapter, from verse 8 through to the end, we take as it were a step backwards into the millennium, and that's where John sees New Jerusalem uh, as it will be in the millennium, but we'll come back to that later on. So as we said, here we've got the grand climax of the divine plan. We know, don't we, that now for 6,000 years since creation, since the time of Adam, God has been working amongst the nations to call out to them a people for his name. It's remarkable, isn't it, that the God who can create heaven and earth in six days, his long-suffering is such that he waits 6,000 years to uh, attain his new creation through the Lord Jesus Christ. It is, of course, more than that, isn't it, because the next 1,000 years, namely the millennium, the mortals will still have a chance to respond to the gospel message. But after that, as Numbers 14.21 tells us, the earth will be full of God's glory. All this known to God from the beginning of the world. Such is the divine wisdom. We can view these three periods, pre-millennium, millennium and post-millennium, from a different aspect. First of all, regarding the glory of God, that is, we call it the moral glory of God, his character that he reveals, and which we try to reveal uh, now in our day. Paul tells us, God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That knowledge is hidden from the vast majority. It's only those who look carefully into Scripture and they can see the knowledge of that glory in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. But of course, in the millennium, we know, don't we, that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, of Yahweh, as the waters cover the sea. And there it is again in Jeremiah 31. For they shall all know me, from the least even to the greatest of them, saith Yahweh. But when we move into post-millennium, it's not just the knowledge of God's glory, but it's God's glory now that fills the earth. All the earth shall be filled with the glory of Yahweh. We can see it in relation to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, because at the moment, it's Peter that reminds us, we are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. But we read of his work in the millennium, for example, here in Isaiah, he shall not fail, nor be discouraged till he hath set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. Or again in Psalm 2, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the nations for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. But we know that after that millennial period, it's the Apostle Paul that tells us in, in 1 Corinthians 15, Then cometh the end, when he shall deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father. For he must reign, till he hath put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So when all enemies are subdued to the Lord Jesus Christ, he will deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father. And that's the time that we ponder in the early parts of Revelation chapter 21. We can view it regarding the saints, because at the moment we are espoused to one husband, says Paul, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. We are awaiting that time of the marriage of the Lamb that will take place at the start of the millennium. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And we are making ourselves ready right now, are we not? 
but post millennium after the millennium John says I saw the holy city New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband so in the millennium the saints are united with the Lord Jesus Christ but after that we know that the tabernacle of God is with men that's post millennium Peter says now pre millennium if need be we are in heaviness through manifold temptations or testings but it's Paul again that reminds us that's a light affliction it works for us the far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory and there's the glory of Yahweh once again but post millennium here it is in verse 3 of Revelation 21 the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them we can view it in relation to the nation and the land of Israel because for so many millennia now Zion has been a wilderness and Jerusalem a desolation and even now although the people of Israel have gone back to their land in measure Jerusalem is still a burdensome stone for all people and it will remain that way until the Lord appears to rule from Jerusalem in that day the Almighty says I will make Jerusalem an eternal excellency a joy of many generations or again as Ezekiel says the nations shall know that I Yahweh do sanctify Israel or again the Gentiles shall come to thy light and kings to the brightness of thy rising but when we consider post millennium we know don't we that the Psalms tell us for Yahweh hath chosen Zion he hath desired it for his habitation this is my rest forever here will I dwell for I have desired it and finally we can view it in relation to the Gentile nations because at the moment the nations of the world are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest whose waters cast up mire and dirt and of course it's amongst those nations that troubled sea that the nation of Israel has wandered and they were promised when thou passest through the waters I will be with thee and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee but when we come to the millennium that troubled sea is now a sea of glass it's mingled with fire representing the judgments and those who had gotten the victory they are standing on the sea of glass in other words they were ruling over the nations but when it comes to post millennium there it is there was no more sea no more Gentile nations for I am with thee saith Yahweh to, do, to save thee though I make a full end of all nations whither I scattered thee yet will I not make a full end of thee so there will be a full end made of all nations post millennium apart from Israel so we come to consider some of the details of this chapter John says I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first or former heaven and earth were passed away and there was no more sea so the first order of things or the former order of things John says they were passed away we know that during the millennium although Christ and the saints will be ruling there will be mortal rulers as well and this is the aspect which has to pass away and that will give a completely new order of things it's in the previous chapter John says I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the Gentile earth and heaven fled away and there was no place found for them John says concerning New Jerusalem first of all it was a holy city most important a holy city and it comprised of those who strive over striven to make themselves holy and separate to their God in the days of their probation but as he which hath called you is holy says Peter be ye also holy in all manner of conversation or in all manner of living because it is written be ye holy for I am holy New Jerusalem 
was coming down from God out of heaven. Paul reminds us, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Or again in Second Corinthians in chapter 5, all things are of God. It was coming down from God out of heaven. It was coming as a bride prepared for her husband. And this obviously is something different to what we, if we just go back to chapter 19 of the prophecy, in other words, well, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Now that was at the beginning of the millennium that John is describing there. But here in chapter 21, it's post-millennium, it's after the millennium. And this is when the saints of all ages, including those who live their mortal lives in the millennium, are united with the Lord God himself, with Yahweh himself. So, although Revelation describes, first of all, the marriage of the Lamb, Scripture takes the closest union that is possible, humanly speaking, to show how that the saints will be united, first of all, with the Lord Jesus Christ, and then with God, when the tabernacle of God is with man. We read there in Isaiah 54, Thy maker is thine husband, Yahweh of armies is his name, and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. So next John hears a great voice. He hears many voices in this prophecy, but very few great voices indicating the enormity of what is being described here. A great voice out of heaven saying three times, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. The verse is driving home the message, isn't it? The tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them. He will be their God, and he will be with them. We need to see this from the divine point of view, not from human point of view. This is not God coming to dwell with humans, because as verses what 2 and 3 tell us, uh, verse 3 particular, I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And verse 2 says, I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. It was coming down from God. It wasn't God coming down to, to humanity, as it were. That's the wrong way round. Humans will be brought back to God, able to live in his presence. Brother Thomas, Brother Thomas speaks about this in the Herald. He says, men were not ushered into being for the purpose of being saved or lost. That's the human point of view. God manifestation, not human salvation, was the great purpose of the eternal spirit. The salvation of a multitude is incidental to the manifestation, but was not the end proposed. The eternal spirit intended to enthrone himself on the earth and in so doing to develop a divine family from among men. And we know the process, don't we? Back in Genesis, first of all, when they'd rebelled, they hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh. And then we read, he drove out the man and placed at the east of the Garden of Eden, carried him in a flaming sword to preserve the way of the tree of life. And that separation became more and more. For example, Genesis 4. Ken Cain went out from the presence of Yahweh. There's only one way back, and that, of course, is through enmity and sacrifice. First of all, God said in that remarkable verse, Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. There will be conflict. There will be a contest between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, and the seed of the woman will be victorious. And that began, that process began in the Garden of Eden. We know, don't we, that Yahweh had to make coats of skins to cover them, to cover their skin. And so we've listed here the, the steps of the way back. First of all, worship at a distance, outside the garden, and via sacrifice. And then considering Israel 
a nation brought near to God, again, via sacrifice. And then in that nation, the living sacrifice to take away sin. And then we're coming to the millennium, the saint glorified with the Lord Jesus Christ. And eventually what we are considering now, the tabernacle of God being with men. There are passages which speak about this in the Psalms. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures for evermore. And ultimately that is speaking about the time beyond the millennium. As is this uh, passage in, in Psalm 36. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wind. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house. Thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures. For with thee is the fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. And so we read of the results of God being all and in all at this time. In verses 4, 5 and 6 of Revelation 21. No more tears, no more death, no sorrow, no crying, no pain, because all things are made new. And verse 6, he said unto me, it is done, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ has promised to do. We know that, don't we? Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled and then verse 7 reminds us that he that overcometh shall inherit all things the word means to gain the victory over the flesh brother roberts comments on this he says what a boundless field of grateful contemplation is here opened up to the minds of weary saints who here have no continuing city, and who groan within themselves at the many sore evils of the present hour. They languish on the highway while they pursue their ways onwards. They are few, scattered, tired and faint. The road is rough, the air is cold, the night is dark, their spirits sometimes quail within them, and they are ready to give up. And there are times when the faithful of all ages have felt like this. But he goes on to say, Is it not a great reviving of hope and courage to look forward and to know that in a short time at the longest they will find themselves at the end of their weary journey within the walls of the glorious house of God where there are myriads of rejoicing saints clad in garments of praise and mantled in the immortal strength of a glorified nature. And so it is. It is a great reviving of hope when we consider these things. The next verse tells us that the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Here we've got those who are not accounted to be, to be worthy to be part of New Jerusalem. We highlight here the fearful. Because we know, don't we, that we are exhorted over and over again to fear God and to keep his commandments. But the word fearful here is that word delos, and it means timid and faithless. It's mentioned there in Matthew 8. He said to them, why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? And we see why that phrase, the fearful, goes along with the unbelieving and abominable and murderers and so on. So when we come to verse 9 of this chapter, we enter a new scene, as it were. We've considered uh, New Jerusalem, i.e. the world after the millennium, but we take a step backwards in time now, and as on so many occasions in the prophecy, we've looked at the end result, and now we see how that result is achieved. Um, so as we see in verse 9, it's a case of we're looking at the bride, the lamb's wife, uh, among the nations. We read in that verse... There came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And we can't stop making the comparison, because when we go to chapter 17, verse 1, we read there, 
there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me saying unto me come here that i will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters so here we've got the two symbolic women mentioned throughout the prophecy uh, the, the the bride of the lamb the virgin and on the other hand the whore the one who has corrupted the earth for so long the bride as we're into the prophecy has followed the lamb whithersoever he goeth and now she is rewarded whereas the whore she's not followed at all but she's controlled many peoples and now she also is rewarded at this time but this is what we want to consider in the in part two of uh, chapter 21 so we'll leave it there and come back to that we'll look at part two